alternative methods. And then I put down something that I think is uh, tautological, but also important to know. Uh, I said it works well when the problem is easy. Uh, we did a lot of work on HMMs, gesture, et cetera, whatever, and um, it's very powerful for capturing regularities when the regularities are quite clear. You have to do a lot more work on your feature selection and a bunch of other things when those differences are a little bit harder uh, to, to see, number of states and those kinds of things. So, um, you know, that, and that's probably true of most classification methods. Uh, when the problem is easy, they all work great. It's when the problem is not so easy that the, the challenge comes in, and that's when people start reporting on small differences. Um, that means the real issue in, in choosing your classifier is to understand where the complexity and where the difficulty of your problem is. Um, but in general, people still use HMMs a lot, and they use it for describing uh, activity or, or, or time series. And um, you know, it's in some sense your first line of defense uh, against activity recognition. That ends our uh, discussion on activity recognition, and uh, uh, you know there's more and more of it uh, available these days. The other thing is, if you wanted to learn more about HMMs and the graphical models that they represent, like I said, that all comes from machine learning. So that's yet uh, another class, because you know what? There's always more to know. Welcome back to Computer Vision. Megan's laughing already, because you can tell it's Friday. Today, we're going to start on just a couple of lectures that are could be labeled other stuff you should know. It's just things that come along in computer vision that are, are um, relevant. Uh, some of them are very old, some of them are new. Some of them seem trivial, so we don't even teach about them normally, and yet if you don't know about them, you're totally mystified when somebody talks to you about them. Uh, and the, what we're going to talk about today is a little bit about color. Now, I had to wrestle a little bit with exactly how to do this, because my own background, color really came uh, through uh, psychophysics, uh, psychology is my my degree was in uh, brain and cognitive sciences. So, um, and I think of color as a psychophysical or perceptual phenomena. That is, when you see this thing and you say, oh, that's a light blue shirt, that's actually not a physics statement, it's a psychophysics statement. Um, so I'm actually going to start there. We're going to talk about uh, uh, just a little bit about actually an anatomy, and then we'll move on to a little bit of computational elements having to do with color. So. Um, and also, in a few more lessons, you're going to see some, just a few of these uh, uh, slides and discussions again, because we're going to talk about the human vision system. But I need to just talk about a little bit of it now. And in particular, I have to talk about your retina. Well, and my retina, and everybody's retina. What we're showing here is a picture of uh, high magnification, uh, probably uh, electron micrograph, uh, then pseudocolored, of your retina. And you can see that retina is made up of two kinds of receptors called rods and cones. And we'll talk more about the differences between them when we do the human anatomy conversation. But today all we're going to do is we're going to talk about cones. And in particular, there are several million cones in the retina. They tend to be focused more uh, or uh, grouped more in the, near the fovea, the middle. Uh, they're responsible for the high resolution imagery. Uh, that is your ability to see very uh, sort of with good resolution at the center of your visual field. And most importantly uh, for today's conversation, it's your cones that discriminate color. That is that they're sensitive to different wavelengths and your, your visual system uses the outputs of the cones processed through a variety of channels uh, to see color. In particular, there are three types of cones that are called red, green, and blue. That's not really quite correct. You'll see why in a minute. They really should be called long, medium, and short. And you'll also see, as is written here, that the vast majority of them are red and green, and um, a very small percentage of them are blue. All right. So this is a graph of the sensitivity of each of these three types of cones, roughly red, green, and blue in terms of how responsive they are as a function of a single band of wavelength of light. So here you see the uh, wavelength of the light expressed in uh, nanometers. And you can see that there's one channel uh, right here that starts at the longer range and peaks uh, somewhere uh, around there. And then there's another one that's called green, even though it's really just offset a little bit from that. And then finally, what's called the blue, which is really the short uh, wavelength uh, cone. If you were to make a picture of sort of the retinal mosaic and you colored the cones, what you'd see would be a picture that looks kind of like this. You'll notice that in the middle, there's hardly any blue cones at all, and there's some more of them out here. 
all right? But basically, almost all of the cones that are used are in the red and green, and the, uh, the blue is really just there for a little bit of coverage. Uh, and yet, we see color very, very well. In fact, the, uh, this, this notion that there are three receptors that are absorbing uh, light uh, refer, uh, results in what's referred to as the tri-stimulus color theory. The idea is that it's three uh, inputs. And uh, you know, here it says the spectral response of each of the three types of cones. Um, uh, unlike the previous one where we're showing you the relative uh, sensitivity of each of them, what this graph is showing you, just as it says, this is the percentage of light absorbed by each cone, actually by each cone type. The reason that even though blue is so much more sensitive down here, because there are so few blue cones, the amount of light down here absorbed by the blue cones compared to the amount absorbed by red cones and green cones is approximately equal because there are so many more green cones and red cones than there are blue cones. So the question then is, is can we, how, do, how it says can, but how would we use the outputs of, of these three types of receptors in order to see color, and in particular like spectral color. And what I mean by spectral color is you're all familiar with this uh, uh, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. You probably learned that somewhere along the way is the colors in the rainbow. Huh. Well, what it really is is these are different wavelengths of light. And those are the colors that you see when those wavelengths are put out, okay? And I'll, 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 we'll, we'll see a little bit more about what we mean by that, all right? In order to think about starting to understand color in a standard way, experiments were done, and they started quite a long time ago, where you would do the following, right? You would, you would make some light coming into the observer, and that would be some light along that spectrum, so the red, the green, the blue, et cetera. You'd have some pure spectral light, all right? And the observer's job, uh, and here the observer is one great big eyeball, which is kind of creepy, but there's actually a person sitting there, would be to just adjust the amount of red, green, and blue light, and they were given a particular type of red, green, and blue, a particular wavelength of light, and they could put more or less of it, of each of them, to try to get it to match the test light that was being produced. And most of the spectral colors could be done this way. You could just add a certain amount of, of that light. But it turned out that some of the colors couldn't be matched unless you actually added a little bit of red to the original test light, okay? That is, in some sense, in the mixture, you had to sort of like have negative red light, and of course we couldn't make negative red light, so what you would do is you would sort of add some positive red light to the test thing. So that's the first thing to realize is that certain colors, certain wavelengths in the spectrum, you would look at it and, you know, for those particular three lights they gave you, there was no blending of them at all that would equal this color. And the way that gets uh, expressed is the following, right? So here, uh, you were given a certain type of blue, green, and red light. And then depending upon where you are in the wavelength, where you are in the spectrum, depending upon what single light I put out, all right, you would have, this is how much red, green, and blue you would need to add. And you'll notice this area here is the negative. These were the colors Okay, these were the spectra that for those particular red, green, and blue lights that they gave you, you couldn't make the match. So they represent that as being sort of negative red. So color is a psychological phenomenon, all right? Um, you know, in fact, let me go back to, to something here. If I turn on a red light and a green light and I blend them together, what color will I see? Yellow? Yellow, right. So why? When I tell people this at Georgia Tech, some of them tell me, oh, well, you know, red is here in the spectrum and green is here in the spectrum, and when you turn on both of them, you get the average spectrum. No. <laughs> the light doesn't know anything about averaging. So here is a green light, and here is a red light. What happens is this light over here in the green triggers the green cones a little bit more than the red cones, and the red light makes the red cones go a little bit more than the green cones. Okay, so let's pretend for a moment they were sort of balanced. So in other words, if I had a yellow light, which makes both of the cones go about the same amount, your system can't tell the difference between a green light and a red light turned on 
versus a yellow light. Forget this little blue stuff here for now, all right? So the reason that red plus green make yellow with light has nothing to do with physics and everything to do with how your retina is put together, right? The red and green cones go on at the same time. So color is psychological. That is, you can think of color as represented as some combination, linear combination otherwise, of red, green, and blue. And it's related to cones, not to physics. By the way, almost all of us have the same cones, but there are some people who don't. Right? So the sky might not really look blue to them, although actually to them it looks blue, but it's actually not blue because they actually can't see blue. So these people are referred to as colorblind. All right? um, a bunch of people are missing uh, one type of cone. Almost all of them, by the way, are men. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, some reasonable percentage of men are colorblind. Some tiny, tiny percentage of women are colorblind. So it's kind of funny. Back when I was a grad student in psychology class, people have to sometimes do a so I was the TA, people would have to do an experiment uh, and write it up and hand it in. And you could tell every now and then when somebody, shall we say, ran out of time to actually do a real experiment, because they'd say they worked with 20 colorblind patients, 10 men, 10 women. For them to find 10 colorblind women, they probably would have had a sample more than Massachusetts. So uh, there are very few uh, uh, colorblind women. So now the second thing to know about humans, all right, human vision. Humans are much more sensitive to changes in what's referred to as luminance, how bright something is, than they are sensitive to what color it is. Now here's an example. Now this example may work better or worse depending upon how your monitor is set. So if you're not seeing the illusion I'm about to show you, play with your monitor. Here's two images with text on them. And in the top, the background and the text are, now I'm gonna have to change color of pens. They're the same color but they're the different brightness, okay? Different, the technical term is luminance, all right? And probably all of you have no problem seeing that it says text and color without intensity differences, blah, 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 blah. fine. On the bottom, actually on the Mac monitor, I can hardly read it. On this monitor, I can read it just fine because it depends upon how each monitor, and we're gonna talk about monitors and gamuts in a little bit, how they show it, but you could have adjusted the color of the text in there so that the color became almost what's called isoilluminant, all right? So the same amount of luminance, okay, but different color. So you just basically take the, the cyan there and just make it brighter or darker. Don't change its, what we're gonna learn is called the hue, the color, and you can make it go away, right? So the bottom line is that the human system is much better at dealing with differences in luminance. So these phenomena, tri-stimulus tri color theory, difference in luminance. This has been, uh, luminance has been known for a very long time, since the very early 1900s. So starting in the 1920s, people started doing some what are called psychophysics experiments by psychophysicists, because who else would do psychophysics besides psychophysicists, um, of basically showing people different kinds of stimuli and asking them what they see. So some of the first sort of systematic experiments were done by these folks right in Guild in the 20s, although the experiments people know about are a little bit later in the 30s. They were trying to map this notion of wavelength to perceived color, right? So this is what I was telling you about before, where as I change the wavelength, how much do you have to change the RGB in order for you to say uh, that they match? And they were allowed you to be able to say the two colors are more similar to each other through this process, and they defined what was called the CIE color space. It's CIE actually stands for Commission on Illumination or something in French, and that's why it's CIE. So the diagram they came up with here, this is called their XY chromaticity diagram. A couple things to notice, and we'll talk about what X and Y are in a minute. These are the colors at the, as the wavelengths go around, right? So you're getting longer and longer wavelengths, all right, and you get back to here. So the numbers around, the, these blue numbers around the border, those are the wavelengths, and the middle is what you get by blending different colors. Now what do we mean by blending? Well, what they figured out when they were looking at people computing, uh, playing with these RGB lights and other things, was they came up with a new color space that wasn't just uh, RGB, but that it was gonna be a linear transform of RGB, but that the prominent value was gonna be called Y. What does Y stand for? It stands for luminance. Don't ask me why it is, because it's actually from the X, Y, Z space. And the idea is that Y is the luminance, and so then X and Z were two other quantities with which you, between X, Z, and Y, you could figure out the color. And you could represent a wide range of colors, and in fact, in this diagram that I was showing you before, you'll notice down here it says X and Y. Well, 
it was just this X normalized by the sum 